for the greatest show in fantasy football history, hosted by the incomparable Scott Connor and the one and only Ray GQ. I present to you Destination Chill, where football and fantasy collide. G-E-G-P, welcome in everybody. It is Sunday, March 10th, 2024. Y'all decided to chill out this evening with your boy Ray G and my host, co-host, my brother, my partner in crime, Scott Connor. You can find him at Charles Chill FFB. This is Destination Chill Sundays, man. Sunday night, free agency eve. We got a lot of stuff going on in the NFL world. The combine takeout. I'm seeing RAS score all over the damn place. But most importantly, those old guys that everybody forgets about at this point in time of the offseason. The veterans, man. We got a couple of trade moves, a lot of discourse about where players are going, where players are going to end up, where they're going to be left out of. Justin Fields, Mac Jones, 2021 class looks awful as we sit back today. But Scott, man, how you doing this evening? I know you were uh, out with the wife, went to go see a play and some other stuff. So you're pretty excited to just chop it up some some football talk tonight, baby. 100%. 100%. What's good, my friend? We are 16 and a half hours away from absolute chaos. Uh, anybody that has not been around uh, the X streets, the Discord streets, YouTube streams, whenever news starts breaking with free agency, uh, I'll just recommend this to everybody. I have a separate Twitter account that only follows like 10 accounts. It's like Jacina Anderson, Jordan Schultz, like only people that are getting me real news, right, Ray? Mm -hmm. Like only real legitimate news, Rap Sheet, Adam Schefter, and I spend most of my day on that account on another phone, but it's solely focused on free agency because tomorrow in the next really 52 hours from tomorrow at noon until Wednesday at 4 is just wild speculation. You think we speculate a lot in Dynasty. You get to the point where it's like, man, NFL teams are starting to speculate. And it's just 52 hours of rumors, unofficial, official signings that technically are not done. If everyone remembers, there's usually like 10% of them that you get to Wednesday and they're like, yeah, that one fell through. Uh, you remember the famous one. It was, uh, who was it that the Cowboys had? And then he switched to the De Broncos. Was it Randy uh, Gregory? Randy Gregory. Went Randy to, Gregory. Went to Denver at the last minute. And it was like out of nowhere, switch mode. I mean, that happened. So I'm excited for it. Uh, if you're not tapped into the Discord, especially, like we're going to be in there. I'm going to be in there just kind of giving live reactions to everything that happens. So I'm excited. This is my favorite week of the year because it's March Madness Conference tournaments coming up as well. It's just going to be chaos. So I'm ready. Let's go. Well, shit, you're ready to go. I'm ready to go. The people are ready to go. Let me uh, let me make the uh, the chat thing a little bit bigger. We got a couple of folks in there, 126 in there. Make sure y'all hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, all that other good stuff. But let's start with uh, let's start with something um, kind of uh, fun and and uh, just something to get the crowd going, right? This is what we call on Bleacher Report the streamer start, just to kind of get the people going, get in the rhythm, figure out what we're gonna do. But I want to talk some rookies. Scott, just a little bit, and Daniel Jeremiah, NFL Network, tapped in, NFL Connection, yada, yada, yada. A couple of days ago, he dropped his updated big board, updated top 50 big board. So let's just pull that up, look at it, invoke some names, and just get some, some thoughts about how we should be, not necessarily what we think about the player and how good they are, how, how good they aren't, but just how the Dynasty community is going to react if – said player gets drafted ahead of another player if they get that type of capital if they're drafted as a top 35 top 40 asset so let's just pull up Je uh, jeremiah everyone here ray i lost you i don't know if it's me yeah, we lost you, Ray. Myself. All right, am I better now? Is that better? Yeah, Is that no. better? Is that better? <laughs> I was like, all right, let's see. Nah, we're good. We're good. good I go. hit the mute button by accident, dude. I hit the mute button by accident. But nothing too crazy at the top, right? With Caleb and Marv, nothing too crazy. But this is something, Scott, that I talked about happening as a reaction post-combine, and here we are. Romo Dunze is the third best player ahead of Malik Neighbors, ahead of Rock Bowers, ahead of any defensive player that you want to put there. 
Rome is wide receiver three, and then you got Malik here at wide receiver four. Just the dynamic between these two, I don't know what their KTC values are, no clue what they are, who's ranked higher, who's ranked lower, but just this dynamic here of neighbors at three, like wh where are you at with this, and does it really matter if we're just looking at that top six as, as the cluster that you kind of want for rookie draft purposes? No, not really. And anybody checking in tonight for the first time or missed Wednesday's stream, we went through and we really did kind of a, a deep dive on the ADV and just the perception of a lot of these rookies. And we talked about that. We talked about neighbors and Adunze getting closer to the same tier, both of them moving up post combine. I'm actually looking it up right now as we're talking. Uh, Adunze hasn't moved. Uh, but Neighbors has moved up to wide receiver nine. He's up one spot. So he mm. continues to move up. Uh, I, I said I think that both of them are going to be inside the top 12. We're close to it by the time we get to the draft. Uh, and that's no shade on any of the receivers around them, but that's just that's the nature of the beast. You got yeah. guys like Nico Collins, Devontae Smith. Like Those guys aren't special. You know, people have been – those guys have been here for a while. People aren't enamored with those players. I think you're going to see Adunze move up closer to the tier where people just consider him and neighbors in the same tier. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people are still going to lean neighbors by like 60, 40, but I, I, I don't think it's going to matter. I think the landing spot is going to matter in terms of who do you prefer? Because I think they're both going to get the capital. I mean, every list, I mean, you're pulling up Jeremiah has both as top four picks in the draft, yep. top four players. Doesn't mean they're going to be the top four picks, but top four players, which tells me both are going to get drafted in the top 10. A team could trade up. Any of them could go to Arizona. Any of them could go to Tennessee. Any of them could go to Chicago. Like any of them could go to any of these spots. I can sell you on why all of those spots could be good and all of those spots could be preferred over another. But I don't think it's going to matter. I think they're going to all end up in the same cluster, which means we can go right back to the ADV. Who are people never going to quit on as being an elite receiver? It's Marv. He's been there from the get-go. Uh, there's a chance, Ray, where we go up and we go, wow. Marv, Neighbors, Adunze all went within two or three picks of each other, and I kind of like Adunze's spot better. Yeah. You know, one of them goes to the Giants. Maybe the community doesn't like that guy. Maybe that's Neighbors. Maybe somebody else goes to the Bears, and they prefer that. But I think they're all going to end up in the same tier. So that doesn't shock me. I think that's uh, just becoming the norm for most people. And that that's credit to Rome. He He's moved himself into that tier, and that is a very tough tier to crack to be considered an elite player where really nobody questions it. Well, let's keep it rolling. Let's keep it rolling. You got Drake May and Jaden Daniels right here, five and six off the board. It seems, depending on what t hour of the day you get on X, uh, there is Drake May hate and slander, and then there's Jaden Daniels can't complete uh, short passes. So it just depends on when the algorithm hits your timeline. I think those guys are locked into where they're at as the next two quarterbacks, I believe, off the board, although some may argue that it's J.J. McCarthy. You got Brock Bowers, ranked as his seventh best player. So you, of his top 50, seven of the first seven picks are fantasy-relevant guys. So when you're just talking about the strength of a class, this is a very good class. Let's move down the board. You got some corners. You got some tackles that are going to definitely help. These are, these are fantasy assets that will never score you points, but you're paying attention to which teams draft some of these guys. The Joe Alts, the... Uh, the Talisi Fuagas, like that is going to help that running game, help that quarterback out. Good spots there. Uh, you got the Washington tackle moving up. Quinion Mitchell, cornerback moving up. Where's our next offensive weapon? Here we go. Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU is 17th overall prospect. So top 20 for Jeremiah. And then here goes J.J. McCarthy. He's moved up six spots, but here he is at 21. Again, depending on what hour of the day you get on Twitter, He's as high as the quarterback one by some NFL teams could go number one overall, number two overall. Some people still don't seem to think that he's a, a first round caliber quarterback either. So there's J.J. McCarthy kind of right in the middle of this. But that's not a shock. Uh, Adnan Mitchell, 25th overall prospect. So top 50. Scroll down the board a little bit more. Here's one. Bo Nix ranked higher by Daniel Jeremiah than any receiver not named one of the big four. Any running back, Michael Penix and a few spots lower than J.J. McCarthy. So interesting name there with Bo Nix. Move down, a little bit of board, move down the board a little bit more. You've got Michael Penix at 33. Lad McConkey is a top 40 player at 34. Continuing down his board, let's see who falls inside of that top 40. And his biggest mover, a lot of people talked about this on X over the past week, Ricky Pearsall 
coming in as a top 40 asset, according to Jeremiah. You got Xavier Worthy at 41. Move down the board a little bit more. Troy Franklin falling down to 43. Got a tackle right there. Keon Coleman still comfortably inside of his top 50 at 45. Malachi Corley, who did not test at 47. And the final offensive player on the board for Jeremiah is Roman Wilson as player 49. So there goes his top 50. And the only offensive skill position player that dropped out was Jatavion Sanders, who was currently, who was previously at 46 overall on his big board. And he dropped out of the top 50. So uh, I think the most obvious name that sort of was invoked through this list was right here, number 39, Ricky Pearsall. Well, what, are the, what are the streets telling you about old Ricky, Scott? Well, I mean, like we talked about the other night, I think this is very in line with how your dynasty drafts are probably going to go. There's going to be a huge cluster of receivers that go, I don't know, probably starts in the late first. We even talked about, you know, we said, what was the over-under receivers in the first round? We said five and a half, six, somewhere in that range. But it's possible that it's actually a little bit lower. We see three go in the top nine. But then we see teams go, well, you know what? I see 10 that are on my board. And a lot of times how NFL teams will use their board is going to be, okay, well, maybe I have one player above the other. Or should I say some NFL teams will do it one way and some will do it another way. Well, they'll go by their board which that's where you'll see the team that takes a receiver in the first round because that was the best player on their board. And we're going, wow, okay, I didn't really think that team would be one that would take one. But I think a lot of others probably look at it, Ray, like, man, I got 10 receivers that are all clustered kind of around this same grade, and I can afford to wait 32 more picks, and I'll take one of them unless I have a specific one in mind. So I think we may see that. We may see a cluster of them go from pick 25 to pick 75, where you see 10 receivers go or somewhere like that. And that's where it gets into the conversation we had on Wednesday is what does that look like? You may have Malachi Corley below Ricky Pearsall, but as soon as you see those landing spots, one's going to be nope, and the other one's going to be yep. And you probably got to react to that a little stronger than you might have in the past where you would have just chased a profile, whereas I think the landing spot's going to be a lot more, matter more uh, in people's processes this year. And then the other thing that stood out to me was A, no running backs. That doesn't shock anybody. But if this is reflecting positional value in the NFL draft, that doesn't shock anybody. Uh, the second thing, I, I kind of want to ask your opinion. I mean, what do you think the odds are? Because I've been saying this for a couple of years, that teams don't care about that fifth-year option anymore. Right. The odds that a team's just going to trade up into the first so they can get Bo Nix with a fifth-year option. I mean, how go through the league right now and think about how many fifth-year options, other than there's maybe a couple of secure players you know, the Brian Burns is of the world, you know, those types where it's like, okay, the fifth year options coming into play. How many QBs though, do you ever hear the fifth year option as being a positive thing Tua maybe like Miami picked up Tua's fifth year option, right? But that's, he was coming off the concussion. They probably had no choice. They just kind of retained him for an extra year, but they certainly weren't ready to commit to him long-term. But for the quarterback position, especially that you've said it, they know they know the fifth year option for a QB. If you got your dude, you're looking after three years going, man, can we long term? Yep. The the, the Jags are going to pick up Trevor Lawrence's fifth year option, but I guarantee their plan isn't. Well, we're going to ride T law out for two years. Then we're going to probably franchise tag him. We're going to hold him hostage until 2026. Right. Then try to get the deal done. They either know he's the guy or he's in, Daniel Jones territory where they're not picking it up or he's in Mac Jones or Justin Fields territory where they're probably not getting picked up. Mm -hmm. So I I just don't see a team trading up into the late first just to take the QB. But I am curious if you think that's possible with Penix and with Knicks maybe being seen by some NFL teams as first round caliber or more importantly, what I've seen teams say is after the top 15, 18 prospects, it's all flat from like 20 to 50. So if a team needs a QB, do you think somebody is willing to move? And will that change the dynasty opinion if a guy is the 28th pick in the draft at quarterback versus Michael Penix is the 37th pick in the draft? We don't. We wouldn't care if that's a receiver. For a quarterback, though, what would the perception look like? Talk about it. Yeah, I think I I don't think NFL teams need that fifth year to figure out if they got the guy or not. I I believe that mechanism is only deployed 
when they kind of have somebody, but they really don't know. Like they re like I need I need you to do it one more time. But Joe Burrow didn't even get close to seeing what the fifth year option felt like. Neither did Justin Herbert. No, they didn't even they didn't even sniff what that might become. You know, I think that only happens in the case where somebody inside of that organization, owner, GM, head coach influence, isn't quite sure about said player for whatever reason, injury, skill, direction, whatever the case may be. I believe that tactic is only deployed in those cases. So would a team move up in order to have that ace in the hole? I don't think so. If a team moved up for Knicks or Penix, I think it would truly be they don't have a second. They don't feel like they've got enough ammo to to move up later on or whatever. They don't even want to risk it. Let me go get the guy now. I'm on the phone with the Bills. I'm on the phone with the Cowboys. I'm on the phone with the Chiefs, and it's not going to cost us that much, and we can make sure that we get our guy now because we don't trust the fact that we might be able to pull him off later. I think I think that I think that is the only that would be the logical reason why a team would trade up to get one of those guys. Is it going to happen? Me personally, I don't think either one of those guys are first round caliber quarterbacks, so I would not do that. But all it takes is one dog. All I we, we could sit back now and revision his history. How the hell did Kenny Pickett go in the first round? Like, what are we doing? Like, how did how was that possible? All it did, and thirty one other teams might have said hell no, but all it took was that one, the Pittsburgh Steelers, to say that we could work with that, we could figure it out with him. They make they pull the trigger, they draft the guy at the back of the first. Yes, it absolutely could happen, but I wouldn't be doing that if I were a team. And it damn sure wouldn't be because I get a fifth-year option on said quarterback, man. They know who they, they know what they have in that player long before that end of the fourth season. And, you know, they know what they got. They know what they got, man. So this is the, the big question then. Let's assume that doesn't happen because we're both kind of saying it doesn't seem like it's a viable thing or it's strategically really that much of an edge to trade up into the late first because you're still going to have to give up capital, right? The team trading that pick yes. is going, man, this is the first. You're trading back to, you know, you're trading up from pick 40 to pick 28. You still got to give something up. And here's the thing. I think you probably look at those teams that are drafting at the top half of the second round. Those are going to be the same teams that are looking at taking Caleb Williams Drake May, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy. Like, you're not probably thinking, oh, man, Washington. Washington has two of those picks. They're probably taking a quarterback in the top two. So you kind of feel, like, insulated. Like, okay, those teams aren't going to take one. It would take another team trading ahead of me to take one of the QBs. But how do we value? This is the big question, because we kind of talked about it the other night, but we focus more on the receivers. How do we value... Let's assume Penix and Knicks go in the second round. That's a fair assumption, right? Don't you think? They both go in the yeah, second, be round. second round. They picks, get second yeah. round capital. All right, so let's assume that. I'm not going to say Rattler, even though I think it's a chance Rattler goes there too. Maybe it's a little later, but I think there's a shot. But let's just assume Penix and Knicks go in the second. Two things are going to be true. One, they go in the second, which is good enough draft capital to where historically second round QBs get a chance. Now, it is not the insulated chance of a guy that gets drafted in the first round. Right, It is probably one year. It is probably a short leash. But there's going to be some interest in taking a quarterback to start short term. Right, There's a benefit. If you hit on a guy like a Jalen Hurts, you get some cheap years with good starting quarterback play on cheaper deals. And I think the bigger benefit is you don't deal with the first-round contract. You don't right. deal with the option. The guy actually gets to the market a little quicker versus having to wait. So it's good for the player, and that's actually good for the team if they know the QB is the guy. You know what I mean? I doubt Philly wanted to wait another year on Jalen Hurts because what would have happened? They would have paid more because look at the cost now. You know what I mean? They would have paid yep. more because the recap went up 8% from what it was last year. So I think they're probably glad they got that done. However, dynasty value. Let's get back to that. These guys go in the second. They go to teams that clearly have a no quarterback answer on the roster. Maybe a team has an O'Connell or a Jarrett Stidham or a Nick Mullins, or they bring in somebody in free agency. This could be the team that also brings in a Tannehill or a Jameis or someone like that. But for all intents and purposes, you look at the Bo Nix or Michael Penix pick in the second, and it is a team where you go, all right, that guy's probably going to start this year. That guy may start from day one, but I'm going to bet he's going to start the majority of the year, at least half, if not 12 games. Because why not? You don't draft a guy in the second round 
to sit all year to then go next year, what do I do with that guy? Unless right. you're prepared to play him and see if you have a Jalen Hurts or see if you have a guy where maybe this is the answer, but it's a second round pick, what are you doing? So how do we value that guy? Historically, Ray, those are awful bets. We went through the list and it's like Jimmy G, Derek Carr, Andy Dalton, Jalen Hurts, Drew Brees. I mean, when we're when you're invoking the name Drew Brees and Andy yeah, Dalton, you're, you're, like, back. you're going yeah. back a little bit. Away. Yeah. So typically you don't find quarterbacks that come in the second. Now there's some in the league that went in the fourth, the third, the fifth, the seventh, right? Like those exist. But we're talking about the intention of drafting a guy that is not quite a first rounder in the second with the intent of, hey, we're starting him. But how do we value that guy? for dynasty knowing the odds are not great that that is your long-term option but also knowing given how people treat the qbs you better bet michael Penix in atlanta or bo Nix in minnesota is going to elicit excitement from people where they're sold he's the guy they're sold that is the next well i think i think it's this. whatever I, all right uh, let me let me answer this quickly because i want to get to some free agent player takes right i think i think it's going to be it's going to be perception versus reality. I think there are two different types of windows. The perception window, what people think that player is going to be once the team drafts them, and that will carry on for the better part of the entire summer leading up to the start of the season. The perception and the thought, the hopium, whatever you want to call it, of what that player in that situation is going to yield. Because the same way we talk, because normally what people do is, they, they reach for best-case scenario. Michael Penix goes to Atlanta, and everything goes well. But what if he doesn't go to freaking Atlanta? What if he does get drafted by the Dallas Cowboys, right? And he's the backup to Dak Prescott. I'm not saying they're going to spend a second, but a spot in which you can't foresee immediate opportunity, I think they're only as good as what the perception is at the moment they get selected by that team. And then the reality is, if they are good, they'll have some value. And that value will remain for as long as they're on the field, and they're playing. But the moment anything happens to disrupt or cause fear to whatever that perceived value was going into the season, they will not have the viability and the staying power to maintain that value, that dynasty value. Because people will say, ah, man, I, I knew it. I mean, people are already doing it. One season removed from a Super Bowl. You know? Like, just, you're asking me about fucking Michael Penix and Bo Nix? Jalen Hurts was QB what last year? Fantasy. Top three? Top five quarterback? What was what was his quarterback finish, right? Just one year removed from this season, he was a top three quarterback in all formats, dude. All formats. He goes out there and has a downtick in production to a degree, and it wasn't even like he fell off the face of the earth. And people are all, oh, man, he's not that good. I knew, I knew he wasn't that good of a quarterback. I knew it all along. Once the tush push gets eliminated, he won't even have a job in the NFL. There won't be third... There won't be one of 32 spots available for Jalen Hurts to operate quarterback. Soon as they get rid of the tush push, he's done. Might as well put him in the UFL. So I think there's a prime living example of how dynasty managers and fantasy football gamers treat players that were not highly drafted. And that is not just exclusive to Jalen Hurts. There's probably a lot of different positions and a lot of different players that if shit were to hit the fan, they'll do a quick 180 and pivot, turn tail, tuck tail, and go the other direction. I think it's just as simple as that. You'll have a perception window of what people think the player will be able to do, and then the reality window of what they are actually doing on the field of given opportunity. It's it's understanding and reading how fantasy gamers are going to react to situations is the easiest thing to do, man. Because no, don't nobody got no conviction. Don't nobody really, truly, very few people actually have a strong opinion on somebody one way or the other. They're listening to somebody else. They're taking shit that they heard somewhere else. And then they're just reacting to what other people are doing. Very few folks got strong opinions and convictions. And those that do, and they're watching it, they're paying attention to what the team's telling in, and not saying it works out all the time, but those are the ones that were not selling Jalen Hurts in that moment. Because they're looking at the situation and saying, ah, man, he's pro there's probably just as good of a chance that Philly roll with this guy moving forward. I just I think that's all it is, man, is perception versus reality. And that perception window, that's like the real value. That is where you really can capitalize on other managers by that perception of Penix in Atlanta, Bo Nix going to 
I, I don't need they're they're very lim Minnesota or wherever the hell he can land up. I, I think that's how it's gonna play out, man. So two quick points and then we'll move to free agency. One, I'm assuming if they go in the second, they go to a team where it is unencumbered, they will be starting. There is not another good NFL quarterback. Someone mentioned in the chat, you know, the Rams take one of these guys as their successor to Stafford. That's a different conversation. Something like that happens, we're we're not talking about this same thing. But let's assume they go to one of these spots, Denver, the Raiders, the Vikings, Atlanta, New England, Washington. I mean, any of these spots that could move around the draft. A, Penix, I'm going to ask you both players, an unencumbered spot where it's clear they're going to start. And the, the, the chatter is that they're planning on starting this guy, Ray. Is Michael Penix a first-round super flex pick? First round ADP. Yes. 112 or higher. Yes or no? Simple. Yes. Answer. Okay. Yes. Same thing for Bo Nix. Is he no. first round super flex pick? Okay. No. Okay. That's that's the ADV difference between Penix and Nix, right? Your answer Correct. is one yes on Penix and two on Nix. Okay. And then two, with that being true, is your threshold of what you would be willing to sell them for higher. Meaning, like, would you still sell Penix for what you look to be a kind of a shaky 2025 first, or are you going to let that kind of simmer a little bit before you do that, knowing what you're, what you're seeing? Because I think plus EV, I would tell you, you want to sell those guys before the next season, historically. But when do you do it? Do you do it in training camp? Do you do it in the preseason? Or do you do it? I mean, you remember like week 10, week 11, man, Sam Howe, the future QB in Washington. And he didn't get in the second round. He didn't come from where Penix and Knicks did. He wasn't handed the reins year one. He waited. And people still were going, I'll give you my 25 first. You know, like, so I think you can simmer that a little bit. Let it steep. But I do think before the end of the year, unless I, I'm you I'm all know, for simmering. I, I, I think where, okay. where okay. I kind of, you, you know, we have these talks, man. And we have these, when to do it. I think that's the... You and I are very much aligned with these type of players. If you get any second, make the deal, right? Any first for a certain type of player, you make the deal. I think where you and I differ is I am more comfortable with letting stuff simmer just a little bit longer, right? There, when it's on the crock pot and it's on low, I don't got to rush, man. I know that it's going to cook. I know that when I wake up and I don't got to get up at three and check it, get up at five and check it. Maybe by the time you wake up, it got a little overcooked and it's, it's a little more tender than you wanted it to. But I know it's going to be OK when I wake up. Like there are certain players in certain positions, in certain situations that I'm willing to say, I'm going to let this joint cook for a little bit longer. I'm, I, I'm not going to leave it on all day. I'm a, it will come off in the morning. But, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm in no rush to make that move. I'm in no rush when I'm looking at a situation like like a like like an Amon Ra, like a Hertz, where they are the guy for the foreseeable future, at least for that season. I'm in no need to make a move week one, week two, unless you truly think shit's gonna fall off the rails, right? But other than that, Puka, like I'm letting Puka bake. I'm gonna let him stay on the pot, stay on the stove. I'm gonna let that gumbo thicken up a little bit longer before I make a move. So for me and you, I think we are totally in in total alignment with. The right strategy play is those second round quarterbacks. It's probably a good bet to get off unless they go out there and and you can tell yourself a story that that team is going to stick and ride with that player. Probably a good bet to move off of them before the end of the season. But at the beginning of the year, I'm looking at the schedule. I'm looking at how things are going. And sometimes you just let it ride. Have some conviction to say, I'm going to let this situation ride. Maybe not everyone. You don't want to ride. You don't want to ride Davis Mills, right? I ain't trying to ride no damn Davis Mills. But there are certain situations with certain players in the sentiment that dynasty gamers have about that player. The difference between like a Hertz and a and a and a Kyle Trask, a Hertz and a Kellen Mond, a Hertz and a David. Did nobody like any of them guys anyway? But when you looked at Hertz, there was steam and enthusiasm for that archetype of quarterback being successful in fantasy. Therefore, it gives you a little longer extension on that leash. So. I'm 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 gonna let Michael Penix if he's the starting quarterback going into the season, well, he's gonna be a starting quarterback on my roster for a little bit. He's gonna simmer. He's gonna simmer and then I'll move him in due time. That's that's just how I'm going to approach that situation. But we do want to pivot and talk about some free agent moves, some free agency moves, some signings, some re-signings. 
I haven't seen much of anything. I saw in the Discord something was posted. Is it true that Jared Goff was extended? Did Jared Goff get an extension or no? I was, didn't see a Jared Goff extension. Okay, no Goff extension. It was just Baker, right? Just, just Baker, Baker, right? Yep. So Baker got three-year deal, 50 mil guaranteed or something like that. And what the, the cliff notes was, locked and loaded, can't move him in 2024, makes it very difficult to move him this year, a little more team-friendly to move him in 2025, but essentially it's like a two-year deal for Baker Mayfield. What's your just instant reaction about that? I think this is a a hell of a bet that if you bought Baker for for cheap in a startup last year because he didn't cost you anything, you got him as a throw-in in a trade. Like This is a nice little piece that you have in your super flex roster arsenal, quarterback arsenal, that uh, has got some security. And he got his big play weapon back. Rashad White is back. I mean, Baker Mayfield is a rock-solid QB, too, moving forward for us for at least the next year or two, man. Yeah, I think you're probably looking at similar approaches to what you saw with Daniel Jones, Derek Carr, Geno Smith last year, where essentially they're getting two years. Now, you've seen how those kind of work out in all directions, right? Doesn't mean they're getting two years. If you're as bad as Daniel Jones, you may not get two years, but he's not going anywhere, right? It's like he's not getting cut, but he may not be the starter. Uh, and then Geno, I think Geno's kind of in the middle. Derek Carr may be kind of in the middle. But both of those guys, essentially, they're year to year, but it's also not the kind of contract where you go, okay, this is only a one-year bet. So I do think you have to move up Baker a little bit. I think he probably moves. He's QB 22. Uh, you know what? Looking at some of the guys that he's with, like here's a hot one, right? Do you think he's closer to Tua Tagovailoa than people really want to uh, really want to surmise at this point? They're about six spots apart. But is there a huge difference? Is there really? No. Besides where they're drafted in, in startups, I'm sure there's a big difference in that. I, you know what? I, I think maybe, yeah, but I think that gap is closing. I think it's probably similar to how he's viewed versus Goff until he gets extended, how he's viewed until Dak, until you know he's extended with Dallas. So, I mean, does that mean Baker's in the top 20? He's probably close. But you feel a lot better, just like you felt if you had Derek Carr last year. When he moved to New Orleans, you were like, oh, man, I'm not really sure. But you bought yourself a little bit more than just the year to UQB. So I think he's fine. I don't right. think he's somebody that I'm aggressively buying, but it's good to see him. It's good for him. He came from, you know, the top of the world to the bottoms, given up on, right? Signing for a one-year $4 million deal with his less than the backups got last year. If you remember, Brissett and Heineke were getting double that. And Baker gets this, and then all of a sudden he's getting a big deal this year. So good for him. I'm happy for him. It's pretty much uh, it. Clay, no more fans. Clay from uh, – your, your co-host, for, for Clay from Trades and Five. What's up, Clay? 110 or Baker? Depends yeah, on the team. That's still tough. I still think I probably, I'd, I'd probably, I I'd no, because I probably would lean the pick. Because here's the thing: what do you think I can get with that pick? I think I have a better shot of getting some ADV with that pick, and I think I have a better shot, kind of patchworking the spot Baker would fill with a cheaper pick. I could probably get Geno Smith or Derek Carr with the cheaper pick, and I don't see the the difference that big. To where I'd rather give up the 110. So I'd rather go a little bit cheaper if I'm just filling that spot. All right. Well, let's uh let's 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 spice this joint up. Let's talk about a quarterback that is unsigned. And as we sit here today, it looks like these spots is drying up, Scott. Let's talk Justin Fields for a little bit. Um, what's surprising to me is there are still people who think the Bear, Bears are gonna roll with Justin Fields. Uh, there's still a large subset of people who are are not convinced that they take a quarterback at number one. I'm seeing it in mocks. I'm seeing it just in conversation amongst amongst the X streets. But there's still a large subset of people who believe Justin Fields is going to be the quarterback for the Chicago Bears in September of 2024. As you look across the NFL, the rumors are the Falcons have little interest in him. The Steelers, not not their, his cup of tea. And then you just start going down the list, man. There's There are honestly, dude, like a landing spot to where he can go. And even in that situation, I don't know if he walks into Las Vegas and they say, you know, here are the keys, dude. There's, here's the keys. Here's the keys to, like, you got it. You're the starting quarterback. I don't believe that to be the case. I think wherever he goes, if he gets moved, he's going to have to be in some sort of competition or he walks into a, a team where they say, 
we're, we're looking to upgrade the backup position and such and such is the starter. But when you're truly looking at the 32 teams, how many locations are even available for him to come in and compete? Starting to get down to like a spot, one single spot. And you never want to be the last. What, what do you always say? You want a player to be wanted, not feel like they. What's that saying that you always say about somebody actually wanting you rather than settling for you? That's kind of what it feels like we're at with Fields. And yet I'm seeing him. We saw trades in the Discord today. 106 straight up for Justin Fields. Straight up. St nope. I, I, 106. Give me, give me the pick. I, give me, I will send you the pick. Give me that Justin Fields. I mean, what, what are we doing at this point, man? Like, you've you've got to have a stand on one side of the fence. You can't straddle the fence on this one. You cannot do it. Well, it's important to remember there is probably six teams that have draft capital in the range where they're going to they're going to pick. I, I just want to set some ground rules because I want to walk through this with you. I want to really make it to where we can leave this with some takeaways because this is going to be the number one story over the next 72 hours for dynasty in terms of like a high-end dynasty asset that could get moved. If there's a move with Justin Fields, it's probably the highest-end dynasty asset that could be moved in free agency, right? Wouldn't you say? If he's moved somewhere, like it's a it's a quarterback that people have seen as elite, I think it's probably the most relevant dynasty piece. So I'm just going to kind of go through. Uh, and Remember, there's teams that are in position to take quarterbacks in the draft, and there's going to be at least four of those. We've already said four QBs are going to go in probably the top 15 or better. And would you agree, those four teams, whoever they are, they are also not trading capital for Justin Fields, yes? Correct. Okay. And one of them is obviously the Bears, but you get the point. Uh, so I'm just going to go through the teams. You just tell me, it, yes or no, if there's, we're going to do this real quick. We're going to do it in less than two minutes. Yes or no, this team could be a suitor or a landing spot for Fields. Dallas. No. Philly. And I, and I mean to the point sure. where people would be excited for him as the oh, starter. No. Not, not, okay, backup. Because no. here's the thing. If it becomes he's a backup option, that 15 teams are now interested, right? Yes. There's a big difference. I'm talking no. this is a viable well, spot let me, let me for them to trade Dallas, for him and go. hell no. Philly, hell no. Oh, exactly. Okay. Uh, the Giants? Draft, draft range. No. Okay. No. Washington. Draft range, right? No. I'm, I'm going to say the draft range because that's the ones that you're probably sitting there no. thinking, okay, they need a quarterback, but yeah. Right. No. Uh, all right, we'll continue. The Lions, no. No. Uh, Green Bay, no. No. Chicago, obviously no. Uh, Minnesota, we've heard that one rumbled a little bit. Uh, we, I've been very vocal that nobody the in the NFL that is no. has connected that, Minnesota the answer is no. Yes. Kevin O'Connell yes. ain't doing that, no. Yes, okay, so those are all out. Uh, Tampa Bay just locked up Baker. That's a no. New Orleans nope. just restructured Derek Carr. That's a no. Nope. Uh, Atlanta, okay. A Atlanta's sure. viable. I sure. think they're interested, but yeah, that, okay, maybe. Uh, Carolina, no. No. Uh, San Francisco, no. No. Uh, the Rams, no. Seattle? No. No. <laughs> No. You put you put Arizona. Fields, no. You put Fields next to Geno Smith, and he and it's a passing clinic, extraordinaire with with Geno Smith yeah. next to Justin Fields. Yes. So in the NFC alone, we've we've said no to every spot except for Minnesota and Atlanta. As like I could squint and see it, but even both of those were like the scheme just doesn't work and. You know, both of those teams, one of those teams is in the division, so that's another thing that complicates things. But the NFC, I mean, other than if it's a team that's looking at a QB in the draft, it's it's the NFC's dried up, honestly. AFC, Buffalo, no. Miami, no. The Jets, no. Talk about a circus. It, the Jets would get fields, right? The Jets, I mean, that, that would be the spot. That, that would uh, be the spot. New, New England, England. Sure. is that viable, Ray? Sure. Okay. That, that's sure. one I could see them trading out. Sure. Taking fields, not taking QB. That, sure. That, I'll count that Sure. Uh, Baltimore, no. Cleveland, no. Cincinnati, no. Those are all no's. No, no. question. Uh, how about Pittsburgh? They said no. no. They said no. I, so, no. I can't. No. Okay. But it's at least a spot, right? Sure. Without a pick and without a quarterback. Sure. 
Uh, Texans, no. Jags, no. Colts, no. No. T- Titans, why do they want another Levis? You know what I mean? Like you yeah. want two of no, them? You, it, you it's the got, same type you of issue where you don't know which that, one, you're, no. that you're struggling with right now. You don't need another one, no. Yep, Chiefs, Chargers, no, no. Uh, Raiders, okay, I could see the Raiders. I could, I mean, I could see the Raiders. The, the, the uh, only Sean reason Payton. I can't, he's got Luke Getzey as the OC. He just left the, the I, I'm just, I'm just saying like that doesn't even make sense to me. Listen, the point of this exercise is to just literally physically go through the teams that are no. And then the remaining teams to your original point, when you're sitting there going Atlanta, man, that doesn't seem like Zach Robinson's type of QB. Man, Minnesota, that doesn't seem like Kevin O'Connell's QB. Uh, Seattle, yeah, he's probably not beating out Geno Smith. No. Uh, New England, okay, that would take a big move of them trading three, committing to fields, bringing him in. Pittsburgh, you know, the point is there's maybe six to eight teams, and we have literally poo-pooed all of them to the point where I just believe if we would have thought Justin Fields had a landing spot, you'd already be hearing, man. Raiders are really interested in them. They're trying to work out compensation. You know, they're just trying to figure out what it's going to cost. Have you heard any of that? Have you heard anything positive about how the NFL view, views Justin Fields Nada. at all? Or has it just been Nada. man? It's it, pretty quiet. Let me tell you, quiet, only, let, me front, tell you right? Which, let me tell you who's pumping that that Fields uh, that Fields hype. It's old Marlon in the chat right here. My man Marlon. He's the. If he becomes a backup, I'm going to lose my mind. Why haven't the Falcons just done it? Ray, stop messing with me. This is who's doing it. It's damn Marlon. Marlon is pumping up the field's love. Because I ain't heard Nat team talking about we we – and it's not like it's some covert operation here. Like, normally you hear the rumblings, right? There, Hey, there's some serious steam starting to happen. You hear that with the Falcons. And, and with these first-year head coaches, and I'm going to just say it like this. This Raheem Morris's last shot, right? Like, I, I think this might be his last shot at being an NFL head coach. Gerard Mayo may not get another shot. And is that really what you want to do is your tenure of, of, of your maybe one and only shot as a head coach? You want to hitch that wagon to Justin Fields? I think not. And again, Antonio Pierce, it's Luke Getzey there. I just, I don't understand how that even works when... Clearly, it wasn't good for him in Chicago, but it's going to get better for him in Las Vegas. And he ain't starting over no damn Geno Smith. I will bet anybody any amount of money. Seattle trades for him. He's the backup quarterback. They'll have seven plays for him to come in, and he's literally going to run the ball. Direct snap, wildcat with fields. That's it. So, I mean, this 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 is reality season, man. Like This, at, at, this is... You can say what you want about what the Bears failed to do and it was all their fault, but here we are, four years later. And he is, by every analytical, statistical measure outside of trust the tape, bro, he's awful at throwing the football. There is nothing good in the passing profile that suggests with the change things could get better other than straight effing hopium. That's it. That is literally it. You're running on hopium. And if you need more, come come subscribe. I'll uh, come pay me, and I'll gas you up with all the hopium you need. If that's what you, if you're running low on that, come to Destination Devi Car. I will refuel your hopium dreams for Justin Fields. But the reality is, man, I, I just I just don't see a world. And and you see this happen, man. Mariota had to he had to wait, he had to wait, but he got another shot, right? Baker Mayfield got another shot. I don't think it's over for him. Even if he doesn't land a starting job today, but he may have to go the path that that's less traveled, right? The road less traveled, where you've got to back up and you get another shot. Maybe that's just his story and his path, and that's okay. Sometimes that happens. Come back and be better than than what the original joint was. But I just I, I don't see. I guess we'll see tomorrow. We'll see tomorrow if he is signed early. If they make a deal, or I don't know, man. I mean, there's a lot of hopium going on in the chat, too. Oh, he's easily better than Geno. He's clearly a top 32 quarterback in the league. Stop. Oh, Who my said point he's better than Geno? And I, Stop. And I, Stop. It, it's in there. Clearly Stop. better than Geno. It's also, look at the bad QBs. He's clearly one of the top 32. Here, So here's the thing. Because I want to shift this. We are not anti-fields. What we have been 
is. Hey, let me go get some beans out the. I'm about to go get some beans out the cupboard. I need to sell them to some folks, man, and tell them they're gonna grow a giant fucking bean stock overnight. I got some black beans in there. Cash app, old Ray Garvin, twenty five bucks. I'll put them in mail tomorrow, and there, there will be a bean stock that you can climb up to the sky. Go to the castle and go to the giant's house and get the golden goose that lays golden eggs. I mean, y'all are insane. Insane. <laughs> well, I mean, and here's the other thing. Just because you think he's one of the top 32 quarterbacks in the NFL doesn't mean he's entitled to a week one starting job. That's not how it works. He might be better than Derek Carr or Geno Smith in a year. But he's not right now, and there's other logistics that go into this. It is not as easy as going, oh, man, we're we're picking third overall like New England. Let's just trade that pick and sign Justin Fields. You know, like it's not that simple to where this isn't I click on my dynasty league and throw out a few offers. You know, there's real money at stake. There's a lot of money at stake with people's jobs. And you you made it very clear. Like if you're in the front office, if you make that deal, and you trade away the pick that could be Drake May, and you go Justin Fields, and then a year later you're in the same spot? Like, sure, the Patriots will move on. You might not. You know? So you have to be comfortable with this. This is not just a fantasy trade-off. It doesn't work out. This isn't I sent the 109 for Fields and he didn't start. Okay, I'll get my first next year and I'll go right back at it. There's other logistics that go into this. But I want to go positive, right? Because I've never been anti-Fields. I've been anti-fields from the end of last year after his injury, quite frankly. When he got injured and you were like, man, he still hasn't been great, and then he got injured, you're kind of like, this could be the end of the road. When you knew it was clear that the Panthers were going to be the worst team and you knew they were getting that 101, this already started, right? We knew we were going to be in this spot. But let's go to the positive side because we also went through this exercise of, all right, you agree, Justin Fields is going to get another shot. In some form or fashion, he's going to get another shot. Now, you throwed up the keys earlier, which is great. It's probably not going to be here. You're our franchise QB for the next two years. Go get it. That's probably not what his other shot's going to look like. But he's going to be in a spot where someone goes, you know what? We like him. We've kind of liked him in the past. We're going to give him a chance. To win this job, we may give him the year. That's what his shot's going to look like. So he's going to have a shot to capitalize again. And what is going to happen whenever that shot happens? People are going to oh, go, all right, we right did the here, exercise yeah. last night, right? What what QBs, what QBs, even if he sits as a backup, let's say worst case scenario, nobody trades for him. He's still on the Bears in two weeks. The Bears settle for a third rounder, and it's freaking Seattle that trades for him, right? Maybe Seattle's like, all right, maybe we'll give Fields a shot in 2025. Something like that. Seattle, the Jets, I don't know some random landing spot that nobody was picking. He will be in line to get another shot, or the perception will be that a team is going to give him another shot. And as soon as that shot looks like it's happening, man, he's ahead of Geno Smith. He's ahead of Derek Carr. He's he's in the Aaron range Rogers, of already. Yep. The Aaron Rodgers, the Kirk Cousins, probably Stafford, Cousins, Rodgers, because those guys are old. He's right back at, what did we settle on yesterday when you were talking about this, like QB 22, yeah. 24, something like that? Right. Like he ins right back into that, which means I'm going to want to have some Justin Fields. But you know what I don't want? Justin Fields on my roster from today until September, and then September gets here, and, oh, man, sorry, he's the backup on the Jets. So guess what you got to do? Hold him for all year, for another year. And then next year, it's, oh, is he going to get another shot this year? So I, it, I'm just basically dying with a roster spot for a year when I could have got out, and there's probably opportunities where I could have got back in before that shot happened. So talk about that, because we agree there's a lot of hopium. We're seeing it in the chat. People will be back in when that shot happens, unlike when other guys get their second shot, people are out. But with Fields, he's a victim of circumstance, and as soon as he gets that shot, he's a guy people loved coming in. That ADV was created before he was even drafted. Oh, man, how does a team pass him up in the top 10? Remember? How did Denver pass him up and took Pat Sertain instead? Oh, how? How could you do that, man? You know? like So the ADV was already there from the get-go. So talk about that. Just that you could 
he people will buy back in as soon as he gets that shot. So I want Fields. I just don't want him right now with what he's. I, I'm I'm just, I mean yes, people will want him if he gets a if he gets a shot. I'm looking at some stuff, man. I'm I'm looking at bare bones because I saw Stanley. That's my dog. Stanley has been a uh, supporter of DD. Rocks with us every Monday, every Sunday, Wednesday, whenever we're around. Stanley's here, but he said, "What is what has Geno Smith done that Fields hasn't?" Um, completed more than sixty-two percent of his passes in a season. That that's what he's done. Uh, thrown for over twenty touchdowns. That's what Geno Smith has done over the past two years: four thousand yards, thirty-six hundred yards, like doubling up. What feel like it? You can two, like a two player. Top ten, you can two, two top go ahead. fifteen efficiency seasons for Geno Smith, back to back years. I mean, I, I didn't even want to go that low, but you look at EPA per drop back, he is one spot ahead of Desmond Ritter and right behind Will Levis and Ryan Tannehill, 38th in the league. And not even one of the top 32 quarterbacks in that department. I mean, he's just, he is not a good thrower of the football by any objective measure of quarterback play that you want to look at outside of him saying hut and running the ball. He is below average. That is not. Me hating on fields, that's me literally just looking at the screen and like doing just looking, just using my eyes and looking. He's below average. That that I don't even think that is debatable. Now, whether you want to talk about the situation, what your personal belief is, you think that if he and then he goes to Atlanta and what happens? You think he's about to you think he's about to just pepper London and feed him and pits and just some level of reality. And, and I think this is what makes Dynasty Fantasy Football so fun. This conversation that we have right here. Because on any day, with any player, there will always be buyers and sellers. There will always be two sides of the market. And that's what makes this game fun, man. This, this, is, this type of conversation is what makes it fun. The thing that we want to take away, and I think you touched on it, Scott, is you don't want to roster that volatility from now until September for an outcome that we at least think is a very viable one, that he does not get a starting job right away. But we both believe that he probably gets a shot at another point in time to get on the field and play. And all we're saying is, why pay for that now? Why on earth? And I don't care if you like Fields or not, I'm going to tell you right now, the worst thing that you can do is go trade a 106 for Justin Fields. That is a minus EV play. Don't, Don't do that. A, you're giving up the value of the pick right now before it even has reached peak value. And you're trading for an asset that you are uncertain, no matter how much confidence or or belief or hopium you have, there is no certain shot that he is one of the starting 32 quarterbacks as we enter the 2024 season. But I want to talk about, since we're on hopium, talk about Jackson Smith and Jigba, who, what I was told, Scott, some people told me that they were going to either trade DK, let Tyler Lockett walk, and JSN to the freaking moon in 2024, and the Seattle Seahawks said, now nah, we're going to bring Lockett back. Come on back. Let's restructure this thing. There are people who were, were in our in our Discord that told us they're out there in the Seattle area. And, oh, yeah, Lockett's a real estate agent out there. He's got, he's got roots in the Pacific Northwest. He's about to retire a Seahawk. Think about, think about it from Lockett's point of view. Man, my family, Tyler, we need you to take a little bit of a pay cut, but we want you back. No problem. No problem, boss. I'll, I want to stay right here. Run it back. I mean, what 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 happens to JSN now that DK's still there? Lockett's still there. They still got the Geno Smith, who's worse than Justin Fields, is still there. So what do, if you don't like Geno, then you damn sure shouldn't be buying into JSN. You, you, you shouldn't be buying into that situation. With Lockett coming back, your disdain for Geno Smith, what are you doing with JSN right now? Well, I mean, it kind of goes back to this is the analysis that we try to go through and find the ADV, right? Because it's clear there's ADV that exists with JSN because I got into it this morning on X, which is always a mistake on, man, it's <laughs> Geno Smith is the problem. And oh you can God. cite numbers day and night of why JSN was the third best receiver on the team and Geno Smith wasn't that bad. But the conclusion is just because JSN isn't smashing Geno Smith is garbage and there isn't really any reasoning. And I don't think JSN is garbage. I actually disagree with the people that say he's cooked because he only put up 8.8 points per game as a rookie or whatever it is. I don't agree with that, 
But I also think it's really fair to say is, is he just another one of these receivers that is stuck in the the flat zone? I don't want to call it the dead zone because you need these types of guys yes. to win any format you're playing. But he's not the type where you come to me and go, all right, he's different than the 10 players above him and the 10 players below him in ADP. And I bet you if we pulled up the list, we're not going to do it on this show, you'd probably go, yeah, you know what? I really don't think he's that different. The only thing separating him and another player that's in a similar range is a couple things. One, the situation. You may evaluate short-term on the situation. But everything else is literally just the ADV. Jaden Reed and JSN are back-to-back. One has more ADV than the other. You know why? Because he started. He started higher. He's born with a silver spoon in his mouth, and the other wasn't. That's it. But I think they're probably very similar. They're not perfect, but the, neither of them are guys I'm just re-rolling because I don't want them. I might what's, the difference between, what's the difference between Kirk, Christian Kirk, and JSN? Fantasy. Fantasy production-wise, what's the difference? Fa- fantasy production, not a lot. And that's where you start getting a little depressed when you go, if I told you JSN has Christian Kirk's career, people in here would cry. <laughs> oh, man. All, the, all he did was Christian Kirk. God, man. That's, I wish I wouldn't have used that 105 on him last year in the rookie draft. But you know what? If you get a Christian Kirk and you have him for six years, that's not bad. But it's because you had that hopium high at the beginning of he's the next Jamar Chase. He's wide receiver not he was wide receiver nine, Ray, before he even I played. I know. I know. There's nowhere to go except for I got humbled a little bit. So all I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna plug the the Heisman tier because we literally talked about this. If you like this conversation, get in there, join for a month, and I would just say it it is worth it for the one month to just download that three and a half hour AMA from last night where we talked about every receiver, right? We talked about Rasheed Rice and Jaden Reed and Addison and JSN and Zay Flowers and how they fit in in the landscape and you know how you can navigate the landscape in that range and how much of its ADV. Tank Dell was in there as well. like All this conversation, but to just JSN, I think he's fine. You know where I want, Ray? I want, exp- I want exposure to him. You know what else I don't want? Too much exposure to him. Correct. He's fine. That that's my answer. He's fine. I want some, but I ain't overvaluing him because of where he started. So you see where he's ranked on KTC, right? Wide receiver 26 without looking eyes on me, Scott, because I don't want you looking. Where's Tyler Lockett at? Oh, God, he's got to be in the 60s. 71. Oh, man. So you get you you got one receiver valued (laughs) as a top 24 guy. And then the guy they just brought back that played on it. 71. You're talking about a 45 spot difference between Tyler Lockett and Jackson Smith and Jigba. Where's the EV at on that side? If you're going to flip a coin, you know what I mean? Value wise, there's no doubt you, you can trade JSN for more on the open market than you can Tyler Lockett. But I'm also, I'm also not viewing JSN as one of those elite war difference makers. So therefore he falls in that threshold range which Tyler Lockett is still in there for me, right? It's still a three-headed monster with an average quarterback in an offense that we don't know what's going to happen this year. They could run the shit out of the ball. They could throw it all over the place. But a 45-spot difference between those two seems pretty wild, man. Pretty wild, in my opinion. And underdog, I just looked, it's uh, 38 for JSN and 55 for Lockett. So it's, it's not quite the dynasty discrepancy. But if you just use those two players and looked at that analysis, if you took keep trade cut and underdog and looked at the gap and why it's much narrower, what what is that literally defining? ADV, ADV. right? ADV. It is this mythical future value that we're assigning to JSN where down the road when Tyler Lockett retires, which we don't even know if it's going to be 2025. Could be 2026. And we're dealing with the same thing next year. So it's just, it's pointing out the ADV, which exists, you know, it, it, I'll just say this, because we talked about this on the AMA. So I tell everybody, go download that if you literally want this conversation more in depth. But we talk about playing Dynasty in a one to two year window. Yet this is an example of a one to two year window, which is smacking us in the face and we're ignoring it because we know Tyler Lockett's going to retire. We know he's going to be out of town. Right, so you can't. How do we say one to two year window? The yet we would sit here and assign X value to JSN and a third of that value to Tyler Lockett. We can't, right? You can't practice what you preach. 
Mason, I'm going to tell you right now, if you want two cans of these magic beans, it's going to cost you a lot of fields, baby. I need I need a lot of ADV for these beans because I'm not about to have you getting all them golden geese from upstairs. It ain't happening. But it's it's I'm excited, Scott, for this week. And I believe I misquote. I said free agency starts on Monday. I don't believe it really officially starts until Wednesday is when they can actually sign with a new team. But it's was it legal tampering is going on and they'll start making the you'll know like tomorrow things will start getting put into place where you'll know this team wants this player. There, there's a marriage on, pending this. I, I just want to say this as the actionable takeaway as we progress through the offseason, because this week will come and go and people will forget that Hunter Henry signed a three year deal to go back to New England. People are going to forget that Tyler Lockett read up The people are going to forget that these older ancillary pieces have found new homes or found or returned to their same home. And when New England spends a fourth round pick on Cade Stover and the Seahawks draft some Malik Washington in the fourth, you, the people are going to forget what things the team has already indicated to us early in the free agency cycle, making it a priority to bring certain players back, address certain positions. Don't forget about this stuff because we, t we do this all the time, man. Once and it really starts like mini camp OTAs. Once you start to see real football taking place on the field, even if it's just in shorts and t-shirts, that that enthusiasm, that rookie euphoria, really does start to take over. And you're that this player is going to come out the gate being the dog, being the guy. And then you you set yourself up for premature, unnecessary, and unwarranted disappointment. Like we have, you set yourself up for it. You set. Going it as good as Bijan is or as good as JSN his profile looked, going into the season expecting Ladanian Tomlinson from a rookie, expecting these guys to duplicate and replicate what Puka Nakua and Justin Jefferson have done is just a silly bet. Like don't don't set yourself up for that expectation when that old vet when Mike Evans is still commanding it. I don't care if they draft the Troy Franklin in the second or not. It's gonna be Godwin and Evans. I can I will guarantee you that the two target leaders for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers barring injury are going to be Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. And if anybody wants to take a bet on that, I don't give a damn if they draft Adnai in the, tw the 25th spot in the first round. It's going to be Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. Those, those should be where your money is parked going into the season. Now, as you progress through it, you might see some flashes and be like, oh, man, next year. This could be something good for Adonai or Leggett or whomever it is that the Bucks take in the first round. But we just do this all the time. Like, don't set yourself up for the disappointment because what happens, Scott, the reaction to the disappointment are bad moves that you make. It's bad trades. It's chasing something that you don't need to chase. It's pivoting off of an asset that the expectation should have already been more level-headed going into the season. We're trying to... We're trying to just talk some, like, reason into you. That way, when you make the selection, right, when you draft Adnan Mitchell, you take him at the 109, he gets drafted by Tampa Bay, you know going into the damn season they got Godwin and Evans and Otten. So when he doesn't go out there and give you 1,500 yards off the rip and he finishes with 650, don't, 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 don't flip out. Don't go crazy over something like that, right? And as early as March... But we got to reiterate this because we see it happen every single year, man. Managing those expectations, not forgetting about this very important period. It's not just for news and shit to talk about, but like these are cats that are going to be thrown the ball come 2024. These are cats that are going to be handed the rock in 2024. And unfortunately for Justin Fields, if that spot does not come to fruition early, the longer he sits on Chicago, the worse it gets for him. The longer they hold on or they can't find a partner, that is that does not, that ain't a bidding war amongst 35 other teams trying to get fields. That is not a good thing. So just continue to pay attention to that. Scott, close us out, man. Well, I think you might have just jinxed uh, into the next situation with JSN of that Tampa Bay is drafting a first round receiver now. You've already spoken it into existence. That's going to be the spot for one of these guys we're just expecting to smash. And that's like a, that's a JSN situation all over, right? Where he's that receiver's the third best receiver on the team from the rip. Uh, I did want to get your thoughts on one more thing, and then I have one more uh, final word for everybody in here that's trying to figure out how to navigate Dynasty over the next uh, forty-eight hours or so. Uh, Jerry Judy, Ray, 
30 second thoughts buy sell action to take think you got to do it pretty soon before tomorrow because he's going to get the news is going to get drowned out if you don't do it in the next 12 hours or so but jerry judy got a good trinity score got some good pedigree there's so, some hopium with people still but let me get into it quick answer really quick and I, we need to talk about this in the discord because i thought about our conversation last night trinity is good on the broncos right so if he were to remain on the broncos with that same situation i'm in on jerry judy but we were talking to Josh, one of our guys last night, and he was a little confused by some things that we were doing. But I think he's right to a degree, right? Although that Trinity is good in that environment, you look at some of the other ancillary metrics, and it's hard to forecast and project what that would look like somewhere else. I think Jerry Judy is probably a little better than people give him credit for. But going into a situation like Cleveland where it's already rocky from a passing perspective as is, I really wouldn't be I really wouldn't be buying unless he's somebody that I can get thrown into a deal. And if I could sell, give me something and I'll tell you what any second I'd probably be fine cashing out on Judy. If if you gave me any second, I would be fine pivoting off of new Jerry Judy in this new role. If he were still in Denver and they had moved Cortland Sutton, I might feel a little differently. But now any second I would cash out for Jerry Judy. Yep, that's where I'm at. I think he's somebody that you you trade because he just got moved and people are excited. Uh, what I would say is I would take him. He's better than Elijah Moore. I'm yes. willing to make that bet, but I'm also willing to bet that in the Browns offense, you can't just say, okay, his Trinity was good on Denver, so it's going to translate. So definitely somebody that I'm willing to sell based on the fact that he's in the news. And here's why, and this is going to be my close for everybody. We're going to get a lot of news. The legal tampering period starts tomorrow at noon. Nothing's official until Wednesday at 4. That is a 52-hour window where things are going to be not official, but they're going to get reported by big accounts. You know, when Ian Rappaport or Josina Anderson reports something, it's probably coming from, like, the source. The player, the team, the agent. Like, they're not making it up. You know, they just can't. I'm sure they know a lot of the stuff already, but they can't put it out there because technically teams aren't supposed to be, quote-unquote, tampering yet. But there's a lot of deals that are already being worked as we speak right now. They're being finalized, ready to announce tomorrow at noon, hey, this guy's tentatively going to sign with this team. Well, it's going to be official on Wednesday. You're going to see a ton of that. But there's going to be this kind of like limbo window where you have to make the bet now. Find people you trust, whether that's Ray, I, our community, or another community, and think about some of this stuff we've talked about tonight. How are people going to react? Think two moves down the road. I mean, maybe you don't like this player but you kind of like the landing spot. So maybe there's a reason to take action. Maybe you love a player, but you really don't like that landing spot. And you're just trying to squint and go, man, I'm so happy for all those Antonio Gibson shares, but you know what? He landed in a spot where there's two guys already just as good as him. I don't know about that. Don't talk yourself into what you want the outcome to be. Mm. And make the bet mm. right now. Go make the bet. Do not wait point, two weeks to where we've talked about it at ad nauseum. You've listened to Trades in 5. You've listened to 20 other Dynasty shows. You've read articles. You've read Twitter. At that point, there's no edge. That's where the line is three minutes before tip-off. That's not the line you want to bet. Bet it now. Bet it when the news happens. Be willing to go, you know what? I'm going to go spam that player for a second. Instead of waiting two weeks, because then you're going to hear 20 people talk like Ray. Exactly. I don't know if I really would want to buy Judy. It I should have sold him for a can, second, can I, and now nobody in my league will pay more? a second because they've been listening to other people. Yeah, go. Calvin Ridley. You buying? They, they, what? They're saying New England's about to spend big money, that they want to push in for Calvin Ridley. And let's just say they draft one of May or Caleb Williams. They've signed Calvin Ridley, and in the second round, they take another receiver. Xavier Leggett, I don't know who the hell. Another guy. You in on Ridley? Or, I, I think... He's, he's one of them players that we kind of poo-pooed on last year. Jags were kind of a nasty team, and but there are a lot of good there are, there's a lot of good stuff in the Calvin Ridley profile, despite the fact that he's old already. But he's got plenty of life left in him, right? As long as he can stay off of prize picks, he'll be okay. Where are you at with Ridley if he goes out there and he commands alpha money? They pay him alpha level because I think the NFL still views Ridley very high. Even if we don't, I think they still view him very high. And it's crazy because 
the fact that he's still playing on a rookie deal is insane, but this might be his one and only payday. This is it. So if I'm Calvin Ridley, he's got a bag chase. I don't give it who he's got to bag chase because this might be it. You buying Ridley or if you're going to sell, I don't know if I'd sell for any second for Calvin Ridley. I think I need to know. Is it like the 201 or the 212? But wh where are you at with Ridley quickly? Uh, I'm in on Ridley. I think he's better than what he produced last year. If you look at some of his numbers, he's probably a little better than... The problem is the expectations were so high, and then he didn't live up to them. So he's just not good. He's not cooked. He's going to get a bag. He's going to be the highest paid receiver on free agency. I'll just say this. I want some exposure, but I'm not going out of my way to pay the, hey, he just got paid $22 million a year price. But I'm also not... He's cooked, and I'm, I'm selling him for any second. So I think I, I, I want some. But I'm probably not going to be on the buying end just because typically the prices get inflated. If he goes to a team and he's seen as the number one guy there and he gets a massive contract, people are going to lean more towards the, okay, I'll take some exposure. He's going to get back to the range where you should have already been willing to pay before. I'm not paying that range above. All right, so it's not quick, one, but yeah. I'm last one and be quick. Saquon Barkley hits one of these spots like Houston or Philadelphia. His value, I just want to get you where it's at now. He's valued as the RB. Where is he at in Dynasty right now? Uh, he's got to be he's still top 10. Where is he at? RB 10. Behind Probably Kenneth like Walker, RB9, ETN, yeah. Kyron, Achan. He goes to Philly or Houston. Where is he Where's he inflate to in any first? Let me just say this. Any first and you're gone regardless, right? Any first and you're gone, but let me push you to the test. Where's the spot that he lands where you have him and you're like, this is a contender. I like this. I may want to ride Saquon Bar because I think there's okay. I think that's okay too. I want people to understand that it's okay to not. If you're like, I want to utilize this player for their points, I want to say that that's okay. I don't want people to feel like it's wrong if you say, I don't want to take a random 25 first. I want to use Saquon freaking Barkley. On the Houston Texans, I want Saquon Barkley, and I want him on my roster when he's a playing for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys. I just want people to know that that is okay, too. We're not sitting here saying it is our way, and if you don't sell, you're an idiot. You don't know how to dynasty. You're doing it wrong. Different strokes, different folks. For you, Scott, I'm flipping the question. Where's a spot to where, let's just say your roster is a win-now roster, and he hits one of these spots, you're okay with letting Saquon chill on your roster? Yeah, I think Houston's probably that spot. I think the Bears could potentially be that spot. Then talked about maybe being in on a running back. Uh, I'm in. I'm in. I still think Saquon's got another run in him. Uh, but I'm in with this caveat. If you're going to be in, correlate that in with what you're doing with the rest of your roster. So you have Saquon and you go, you know what? I don't want to sell Saquon. He just landed in Houston. He could put up a 20-point-per-game season. Don't disagree. You know what you should do, though? Go look. What else do you have on your team? I don't want to just hold a bunch of running back value on my team, right? So if I'm in on Saquon, just make sure it fits right roster construction. But I'm fine being in. I think he's right, got a chance to have another big season. I think it's still. Let's wrap here. Over 400 on YouTube. Nowhere else right here on the tube. Thank you, all 400 of y'all, for coming to YouTube. Hit the thumbs up button. Trades in five will be up here in a couple of minutes. Make sure we migrate over there. But let's hit this one super chat. Before we get out of here, appreciate you very much, Joseph Garrett, for this long question, but we'll get to it. 10 teams, start 12, 2 QB, 2 tight end, 0.5 PPR, so then full point tight end premium. QBs are Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Deshaun Watson, receivers. He's got Addison, Cans, tight end, Mark Andrews, no running backs. He's got the 102, the 103, the 106, the 202, the 207, 209. 325 first and 425 seconds. Get DeAndre Hopkins. Just trying to add DeAndre Hopkins for, I would think it was the 209 and a third. 209 and the 305. You adding Hopkins for the 209 and 305 to this roster? Yeah, I'm okay with it where his other picks are. But you know what? I could also say it's a 10-teamer, meaning those picks are a little bit higher. If you wanted to take a shot on two rookies, fine. I don't know if this team's ready to win with the DeAndre yeah. Hopkins. I mean, it. you could tell this might be a, a trades in five guy because he lists cans and orbs. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know. yeah, yes. But I, 
don't don't you agree? I mean, if if you don't think it does, this team have a shot to win, Ray? With Jordan Addison as your best receiver, you are adding probably a Dunze and neighbors. I mean, I you know what? I don't hate it. This is an NFL team adding a veteran when they don't think they can win. You never know what it can do. Uh, but I could also say, you know what? Don't trade picks for DeAndre. Here's Hopkins. what I would Why? do. Here's my here's my response to Joseph. This deal will be available to you in April. Correct. Correct. Don't do it now. Hold that 209, hold that 305, let some enthusiasm, let some more enthusiasm and steam build. Like, I'm with you. I'm okay with this deal. I'm just telling y'all there's no point to do it. If you're trying to buy some old-ass veteran, I promise you, and we're done after this, they will be there in April. So I appreciate everybody tapping in this Destination Chill stream. Make sure y'all wake up in the morning with myself and Jay Rich. They tapped in everything Scott's doing. The DD team got a lot of good stuff coming. Y'all wait real soon. Y'all have a great Sunday night. We'll see y'all on the Trades and Five crew. We out. Peace.